Hello, welcome to lesson one. This is the lesson mm, of panel data analysis course by Teodosio Pérez Amaral of the University Complutense of Madrid for Chalmers University. In this first lesson, we are going to divide the content into an introduction, a second section about advantages and disadvantages of using panel data, then two usual models that uh, are uh, very common in this uh, analysis and then the general conclusions. The introduction of this uh, lesson deals with uh, telling you what is panel data, which is a typical way in which data are presented now. This is a, a combination of cross-section and time series and the idea is that you have units that they may be individuals, countries, terms, rivers, and that may compose a panel of data. You have observations on, on these individuals over mm, a specific time periods. Uh, the availability of the panel data is nowadays uh, very common, and this is the most common type of panel de data that you are going to find in any applied work. Computers uh, laptop computers and desktop computers nowadays are uh, powerful enough to deal with this type of data and the software is now available. We are going to use Stata, which is the best one. Uh, you may get Stata from a uh, Stata Corporation web page. Uh, you may be able to get it uh, paying a small fee as a student and it is really worth learning how to use this uh, sophisticated but yet uh, easy to use mm, Stata package. Is it worth the effort? Certainly it is worth the effort because nowadays it is the common way of presenting data and you cannot escape this way of presenting, presenting data. Um, there are many different databases, like some of them are classic, like the National Longitudinal Survey of Labor Market Experience uh, in USA, the Panel Study of Income Dynamics of the University of Michigan, the Socioeconomic Panel in Holland, uh, the European Community Household Panel, several databases on developing countries of the World Bank, and uh, many other uh, sources uh, produce um, panel data nowadays. Some of them are public, most of them are not public, but that, that is typical of any type of data. So to gain access to non-public data is part of the uh, work of uh, an econometrician. Let's talk now about the advantages and disadvantages of panel data. The advantages are uh, numerous and the, you have a larger number of observations, more variability in the variables, a large number of degrees of freedom, that is the difference between the number of observations and the number of parameters, and you have more, better, more detailed information. The advantages are not only the ones that I just mentioned, you also have less multicollinearity in the data of the explanatory variables, more efficiency in the estimation, uh, so that means that uh, the esti your estimates are more precise. You are able to respond to questions that cannot be answered with other types of data, like uh, uh, questions related to disaggregated behavior of individuals, firms or countries, and it also diminishes the problem of omitted variables. Omitted variables is one of the worst problems that you can encounter in econometrics. So omitted variable means that some important variables are missing or you have not data or you don't have any idea that uh, they belong in the relationship. So in that case, uh, if you don't use it, you're going to have biased in, uh, estimation of the parameters of the included variables. So omitting some can cause you uh, important biases in the uh, in estimates of the included variables. <coughs> that is a terrible situation. And it says here that uh, 
using panel data in an appropriate way can uh, alleviate that problem uh, substantially. Let's see now the treatment of heterogeneity. Heterogeneity is another uh, feature of panel data. Of course, uh, you can find heterogeneity in panel data, you cannot find it in other types of data because it is there, but it, you cannot um, just uh, be able to deal with it, let, let alone uh, find it in your data. The heterogeneity that you find in panel data arises from two sources. One of them is the observed heterogeneity, and that is a embedded in the explanatory variables and the other one is unobserved heterogeneity which is uh, data that are missing uh, part of the uh, information on individuals or firms is missing and it's uh, like the in individual ability of the person or specific characteristics of a firm that are not properly taking into account by the available data. <coughs> so, in general, uh, neglecting the unobserved heterogeneity may cause inconsistency and biases, while uh, having a heterogeneity that you observe is good, will help you estimate better uh, the models that you are entertaining. Uh, in this case, let us go to the very basics and see what uh, an, what things can happen in a specific example. Uh, the example that we are using, the first one, uh, first equation is y sub i t equals alpha star sub i plus beta sub i times x sub i t plus u sub i t. Uh, since this is a first course, a beginning course, I assume that nobody has seen this double notation y i t uh, in the variables. The i stands for individuals, that may be firms also or countries, and then um, the t stands for time. Typically, you have uh, many individuals and few time observations. So n can be 100,000 or 2 million or whatever. And then uh, capital T may be 8, 4, 20. So th this, this type of setup is the typical one. Um, if we go to the next equation, uh, this is similar to the upper equation except that the alphas and betas do not have uh, sub-indexes. The alphas and betas are the important thing we care about uh, and we would like to know more about alphas and betas. We know little or nothing and then we have to combine the data that we have of uh, y and x to be able to uh, extricate what s sensible values can be for alpha, star and beta. Um, in this case, you also have an error term, an error term because no relationship is perfect, especially in economics, everything is just uh, an approximation. And so uh, what we uh, are going to do is take the second equation as an approximation, and also the first equation is an approximation. You can check that the second equation is a special case of the first one. The second equation is the same as the first one, but no sub i's in the alphas and betas. This is a special case because um, the lower equation is uh, just a case in which i's disappear from alpha and beta. What this means is in the lower equation, all the alphas are the same and all the betas are the same for all individuals. Um, in, in this situation, what we would like to point out is that we have two models. One is the general model, the upper model. Another one is the lower model, which is a specific model. It's also called 
the pool model. In the pool model, we have a lot of restrictions because uh, we uh, are dealing with a situation in which we believe that alpha stars and betas are all the same. In fact, we all only have two parameters of the conditional mean here, which are alpha star and beta, and those are the parameters uh, that we care about and that we would like to learn about. In the upper situation, uh, it, this is different because we have a, a capital N alphas, that means many alphas, and capital N betas, that means many betas as, as, as sample size. The upper model is a, quite a general model while the lower model is very restricted. In principle, we would like to use restricted model because if we use the upper model, this is telling us essentially that um, all the individuals behave in a different way, so there, there's little to learn in that situation, while uh, in the lower situation, all of them behave the same way, and alpha, star, and beta can be meaningful in terms of uh, behavior. Um, let's see some examples of the treatment of heterogeneity. And in principle, what we are going to look at is what happens if heterogeneity is ignored? Uh, what can happen in terms of the estimates of the coefficients? If we look here at mm, this first uh, graph, uh, I painted uh, like three individuals, which is the upper individual, the middle individual, and the lower individual. Uh, the data of this individual are here in this uh, particular um, shape uh, uh, ellipse, and they are different because they are recorded at different points in time. So you have data for this individual that is up here. Then, if for the individual in the middle, you have also data here, several observations, and also for the lower individual here. The, the idea is that I am dealing with an example. The ex example would be x would be the income, and then y would be the uh, quantity of clothes that a person buys in a given month, say. Uh, so we are trying to relate income with uh, expenditure in clothes, and this is a behavioral relationship, and what we want to uh, do is to be able to understand and predict how much a person would um, spend out of his or her income. Uh, you have three different behaviors here, the lower, medium, medium and up. And uh, what I want you to look at is that you have three different lines, black lines, and they represent the slope of this relationship. Uh, and the, the black lines are different from each individual, but they have the same slope. Slope is the beta coefficient. However, the constants are different. This constant mm, here is different from the constant here and is different from the constant here. Uh, the upper one has a bigger constant, the middle one has a middle constant, and the lower one has a low constant. The idea here is that is if instead of taking into account those differences, which are called heterogeneity in constant, you just ignore the heterogeneity in constant, that would mean that uh, you would use a pool uh, model in which the red line would be representing the relationship between x and y. Is that good or not? Okay, so let's check. What is the relationship between the slope of each individual 
and the slope of the red line. So just by inspection, you will see that the red line has a slope that is like three times the slope of the black lines. This is no good. This is a estimating with a large error, with a bias. Uh, now, if you look at the constants, the constants of the three uh, um, individuals are uh, this height up here, this height up here, and this height. Uh, the, all three are positive. What happens with the constant of the red line? The constant of the red line is the prolongation of the red line up to the uh, vertical line and then measuring the distance between that um, uh, cut and zero. So the constant for the red line would be negative. So w essentially what we have why uh, ignoring the heterogeneity, we have a complete disaster. We have estimates of the slopes and the constant that are, are uh, biased and inconsistent. There are many other examples like this one in which, uh, I mean, you can see what is going on here. You can see that the slopes of the black lines are uh, totally different from the slopes of the uh, red line. Actually, they are uh, one, plus one and minus one. They're uh, orthogonal here. And um, you, you also can look at uh, in the book and in the transparencies to many other situations in which you would see that ignoring heterogeneity is very uh, problematic and causes uh, bias and inconsistency and the left one panel is a clear case of that and the right hand panel tells you that if you ignore heterogeneity then you may find a spurious relationship that is um, a non-linear non relationship while if you allowed for different constants you will have essentially a, uh, a model that is linear. How do you check for uh, homogeneity? Well, that is easy. We will see it in lesson two. Uh, and uh, it is uh, easy when you use the usual F-test. F-test that you have learned in previous econometrics classes, but that I will go through uh, carefully later in the lesson two so that you can follow what is going on uh, with these uh, tests and how you find homogeneity or heterogeneity. There are some inconvenience in using panel data. One of them is that the data are more complex. It takes more time to uh, fix the data, to arrange the data, to clean the data, filter the data, uh, and that is an inconvenient. Uh, another inconvenient is that the econometric methods are somewhat more specific and complex. They are less intuitive, and mm, when heterogeneity is not treated, that may lead to inconsistency. Also, we have a problem that can be solved, but it's a problem uh, with incomplete mo mm, panels. Sometimes some panels have missing uh, information, missing individuals, uh, missing uh, years, missing uh, years of a specific individuals. So that, that is incompleteness. And that can be dealt with, but it is certainly a complication. Um, to start with, uh, we are going to uh, look at two different models that are very common for treating the heterogeneity. One of them is the common constants and slope model. This is a very basic model. This is the pool model that we just saw. This is a model that typically uh, is not um, 
uh, amenable to treating panel data because it is too restrictive. The second model, which is the different constants and common slopes, you see that is similar to the previous ones, except that now the alpha stars have a sub-index, so they are different for each individual, and the betas do not have a sub-index, so they are uh, the same for all individuals. So this, this is the case we just depicted in the previous graphs, and that is the first case and second cases of the, of the graphs. So this is the, the common uh, way of dealing with heterogeneity in uh, econometrics. Uh, how do you actually work with this model? Well, the different constants and common slopes are reflected in this model, which is the one we just saw. Um, and it would be easy to deal with because you only have to use a dummy variable for each individual or firm. Uh, it is easy to do. That is something that we did in the 80s, but uh, you don't have to do it anymore here because Stata does it for you in a much more efficient way. So you don't even know how it does it, but it does it efficiently. Uh, in practice, uh, you, you, Stata uses uh, ordinary least squares. Ordinary least squares is a, a way of estimating this, um, this particular model. It is unbiased and consistent when the number of individuals or the time dimension are large. Uh, this is a good property and the property of unbiasedness uh, and efficiency, which uh, I will tell you later, uh, are due to the uh, fulfillment of the Gauss-Markov theorem. So the Gauss-Markov theorem that you may have uh, heard about in previous classes or not, is very useful because it is telling you that this particular estimator uh, when applied to this particular model produces uh, estimate, estimates that are unbiased and consistent, good properties. There is another way of dealing with the individual effects and the individual effects can be treated also as random uh, because the idea is that uh, you may have a sample, a large sample from which that comes from a large population and in that case the alphas may be treated as um, random. It is a random coincidence that um, some specific um, individuals are in the sample and, and those individuals are not very important uh, so their um, individual effects can be treated in a different way. Um, it, they can be, this uh, particular model can be estimated by generalized least squares and generalized least squares is a technique that it may sound uh, familiar to you or not, but the idea is that it is uh, more efficient than OLS but inconsistent when there is correlation between individual effects and regressors. So it is better in some cases and worse in another. Uh, but in general, it is uh, a useful technique of estimation and a technique that we're going to work with uh, later in uh, lesson three. How do you choose between the two previous models? The two previous models are similar but different. And the idea is, the idea following Munlak, which is a, an, an author, um, is that we should have some criteria for choosing between models. It is very important now that you are able to separate between data, which are typically panel data, and they are numbers and um, letters, those are the data. Now, we are dealing with choosing between models. 
we are not dealing with data now we are dealing with models if you if you think of models you can think of um, uh, top models in the that go in the catwalk and I want you to think of that as models they are not data they are models okay so how do you choose between models well that depends on the data but th that they the models are not data they are uh, equations equations that um, tell you how to relate uh, the data so uh, when is the fixed effect model appropriate it is appropriate when the sample coincides with the population we when you have a relatively small sample and they represent each one represents itself and their identity is important so you can think of a situation like the 28 countries of uh, europe maybe now 27 i, I cannot tell at this point and um, each one is important each one is has an identity and um, the treatment that then would be a model with fixed effects. There are different models in which uh, the, the treatment of the data is different. And the random effects model is one of them. Uh, the random effect model is telling us that it is useful when the sample represents a large population and the sample is large also. The identity of each individual in the sample is not important and each individual represents other uh, individuals. And that is the idea of um, the type of data that would be represented appropriately by a random effects model. That, that is uh, the idea. So the type of data uh, helps you decide which type of model do you have. So it's like the measurements of a top uh, model will tell you what is the mm, top model we want to go in the catwalk. If you choose a random effect model, the one of the problems that you have to deal with is how to estimate. Uh, typically you use generalized least squares which is essentially a correction for uh, autocorrelation and um, that is would mean to have more efficiency than just looking at the ordinary least squares. Uh, however, there is a catch here, a problem, and if you have correlation between the alphas and the x's, then we have problems and the generalized least squares would be uh, inconsistent. In that case, we would have to estimate by OLS uh, with dummy variables, which is the typical estimation technique, the very basic estimation technique that we were using first for the uh, fixed effect model. The question here is uh, how do we know whether there is correlation or not. For that, we have help. We have the help of a Hausmann test, which is very typical and very useful. And the, the idea is that it's going to help us decide whether there is correlation between alphas and x's or not. This test will be dealt with in chapter three, uh, lesson three, uh, carefully. So I'm not go going to repeat everything twice. So for the moment, we'll keep uh, the Hausmann test because we will deal with it carefully, both in theory and practice uh, in lesson three. Um, the framework that uh, we have been applying here is quite general and it applies to situations in which we have either errors in measurement in the explanatory variables. That means that the explanatory variables are measured with error and that's problematic, that causes inconsistency. Dynamic models if, in which if you have just dynamics in a um, panel data model, you, you will have inconsistency also. And the same with simultaneous equations. You, you will have inconsistency in each of the three 
uh, first problems which are classic problems in econometrics of correlation between errors and uh, explanatory variables and they cause inconsistency. We also can deal with uh, problems uh, that require maximum likelihood or limited dependent variable. Heteroscedasticity will deal with it uh, very shortly uh, in a simple way and uh, also autocorrelation. And we are not dealing with incomplete panels in this course because it is more uh, advanced. We don't have time to go over, over everything in this uh, introductory course. The main conclusions are that the type of data uh, is more and more commonly available, that the computers and software are available, and no, don't forget Stata, and it, it, it is accessible and profitable methodology. Uh, it, it is used widely all over the world, and it is very useful for applied research. If you don't know how to use it, you are more or less out of the market uh, in applied research.